Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of us from the East Coast. Um, before we get into the subject, let me say a couple of words about myself, as not all of you in this room may know me. Just like many of you probably in this room, I got um, really excited about the world of e-commerce somewhere around mid-90s and late 90s, I started my own online business and then discovered affiliate marketing a couple of years later. I started my in-house affiliate program to promote my own business. I um, did fairly well and had people approach me to manage their affiliate programs. So I ended up selling my own online business and starting AM Navigator, an OPM agency to manage other people's affiliate programs. With time, I also wrote two books, the 7-Eleven type books, as I call them, because one was written in 2007 and another one was published in 2011. And um, this latest book, um, Affiliate Program Management, An Hour a Day, I have a few copies with me, and I will be giving them away at the end of this presentation, but you will need to do something to get a copy, an autograph, all good. So um, uh, listen attentively to the rest of this. Now, you can also see Affiliate Management Days mentioned on the screen. It's um, my new gig started in um, uh, late 2011, a uh, forum, a gathering for affiliate program managers specifically. The first one of these is going to be held in San Francisco in March. So diving right into our presentation, let's first address the first adjective that we see there, advanced. Are the things that we are going to talk about today advanced? And if they are, in what way? Well, to answer this one, let's recall um, the five pillars of affiliate program management. First of all, you need to recruit affiliates. You need to get them aboard your program because without affiliates, there is no affiliate program. Now, getting them aboard your affiliate program is only half the job done because you need not only recruited affiliates, but active affiliates. So then you engage in activation of those stagnant affiliates in your program. I'm sure a problem that many of us in this room face. Then column number uh, or pillar number three is policing. Policing affiliate compliance with your program's policies. And I do hope your affiliate program has a terms of service agreement with which affiliates have to comply. We'll address this subject in a little more detail further down the road, but uh, pillar number four is our constant and consistent communication channel. Pillar number five is optimization of our creatives, landing pages, specific promos, our ongoing improvement of our affiliate program. Well, out of these five pillars, it is the red and the green that we are going to focus on today, the policing and the optimization one. Now, I like to liken these two to the plate. They are like the fruits and vegetables on our plate that are very frequently being missed from our regular daily diet, and that results in problems. Very similarly, the two columns, the policing and optimization one, are integral to uh, healthy affiliate program management and uh, imperative for the success of your affiliate program. So essentially, the things that we are going to discuss today are not only advanced or not so much advanced as they are essential. Now, the adjective does belong there. They are advanced in a sense that you don't bump into the things that I'll discuss today until you've been running your affiliate program for several months, sometimes even longer. So today, we will look at some analysis and optimization questions. We will also discuss some of the common problems and challenges that we as affiliate program managers face, and we'll um, provide solutions for these um, problems. And at the end of the presentation, every one of us will come out of this room with five action points. Um, I'm sure there will not be one person in the room who will not have something new to implement. So let's dive right into the analysis and optimization questions. Affiliate applications is where it all starts. They apply into your program, 
and then you have a choice, either approve them or decline them. And how do you make this call? What things should, be you, should you be looking out for as you review that affiliate application? Uh, let me suggest the following 10 flags, 10 red flags to keep an eye open for. Number one is URL-related mismatches. An affiliate applies into your program, you see the URL of the website where they will be promoting you, and then you see that, for instance, they are selling uh, sports memorabilia on this website, but it is placed in jewelry category or in electronics. That shouldn't necessarily mean you should decline them, but that is one of the red flags. The other red flag also uh, connected with the URLs are trademarks and URLs. We'll address the question of trademarks a little later, but let me say this now. If an affiliate has iPhone or Expedia in their trademark, in their URL, that is a red flag to me. Um, how do I know that they will not be violating some of the trademark policies in my affiliate program? Again, we'll address this one in greater detail a little later. Number three is nonsensical sounding URLs. However innocent they may seem at the first glance, very frequently they indicate that the affiliate who has just applied into your program is actually a spammer. Number four is nonsense descriptions for promotional methods. For example, on Commission Junction, you know how affiliates have to identify whether they are an incentive affiliate. Well, I've seen people, I've seen affiliates um, listing things like, and then you need to provide a description of your incentive um, promotional method. And people put in stuff like, I love affiliate marketing, or I want to make money. This just, this is a red flag. Number five, incompatibility of affiliates promotional methods with what works for you. And the classic example here is um, incentive or cashback affiliates in paper lead affiliate programs. The two models are really not compatible in most cases. For example, if you are looking for health insurance leads or for um, auto insurance or for um, legal um, services, you're looking for those leads, you're um, asking the end user to fill out a form now, the cashback affiliate or any rewards type affiliate, whether they uh, pay money or points, will be incentivizing the end user with the cash or the points. And very frequently you will get really forms filled out by people who are not interested in your services but are looking for, that, for those um, points for some online game or um, for cash. Number six is the inappropriateness of affiliate content, and this is pretty straightforward. If there is something on the affiliate website that you do not want your brand to be associated with, that's a red flag. Number seven, they've applied, their website is inaccessible when you try to access it, or when you uh, type their URL in and um, open the website, it appears to run dangerous scripts. That's a red flag. Number eight, affiliates relying on adware, toolbars, and browser helper objects. We will address this one in greater detail um, in this presentation. Number nine is lack of response. They've applied into your program. You've asked them to clarify how exactly they will promote you, and they haven't replied. Give them at least 72 hours before you decline them. And number 10 is strongly negative feedback. And this is on forums, on blogs, in closed groups for affiliate program managers, like the one that I run on LinkedIn, it's called Affiliate Program Management, a group just for affiliate program managers. And then some networks actually uh, provide you with an ability to leave feedback for affiliates. For example, ShareSale has that. One merchant may leave feedback for one affiliate, and another merchant, when this affiliate applies into their program, see that feedback, which is very useful. Does anyone know who this guy is? Do we have any Canadians in the room? This is Lester Pearson, um, arguably one of the greatest Canadians, a former um, prime minister, uh, who once said that the chief distinction of a diplomat is that he can say no in such a way that it sounds like a yes. And this is what I'm getting at. 
Do not burn bridges. I believe that the inappropriately worded decline emails can actually hinder recruitment. So when you send out that decline email, word it something like this. We are sorry, but your website or the promotional methods um, that you use do not meet our approval criteria. So we have declined your application. However, we are open to reconsider. If we've overlooked your potential, we would love to hear from you. Just email us back a brief explanation of how you're planning on marketing us, and we will reconsider your application. Leave that door open. And on we go to key performance indicators, um, the second of our five subjects that we are going to discuss today. I received this question once. Um, someone emailed me, um, say you've had an existing business running for a while and had an affiliate program, a number of affiliates in the program, some active, some not so active, and then you hired someone to be your affiliate manager. If you could base, he asks, that manager's success or productivity on five pieces of measurable data, what would they be? And I thought, what a great question. And I came up with these seemingly basic, but so very frequently improperly used KPIs. Number one, the number of affiliates this or that OPM or an in-house affiliate manager has recruited into your program over a given period of time. In fact, this is pretty much where many merchants stop, the number of affiliates recruited. Of course, they are interested in the and action, those referrals, the conversions. But when a new merchant approaches an OPM or an outsourced program manager, for example, this is one of the most frequently asked questions. How many affiliates will you recruit into my program? Well, it's a, it is somewhat of an irrelevant question. A seasoned OPM knows that by starting an affiliate program on an established affiliate network, you will guarantee yourself a constant flow of so many affiliate applications a month. And you can sell that as your affiliates being recruited into the program. But the number is meaningless unless the merchant focuses on the activity index, which is essentially the percentage of affiliates in your program which are active over a given period of time. So say you have 100 of affiliates. If five of them are active, the activity index is 5%. So from this comes our KPI number three, or what has that affiliate program manager done to activate previously stagnant affiliates? Something that, that many affiliate program managers overlook. They don't work so much on activating new affiliates who may be, there may be some super affiliates among them if you develop them. KPI number four is the increase in traffic or the clicks, the hits sent to your website by affiliates. And KPI number five, of course, is the desired action, the sales or the leads that you are seeking to generate through your affiliate program. In case with sales, I recommend focusing on the monetary value. Now, if there is an increase in traffic, but no increase in sales or leads, it could mean one of two things. Number one, it could mean that the affiliate is not sending you traffic that's targeted, that's meant to convert. But there could be another reason that is, again, frequently overlooked by many mer merchants, and that is your landing page. It may not be meant to convert for this particular traffic, or overall, it may not be converting well. And this is why you want to be um, split testing on an ongoing basis, not only for the affiliate traffic, but for everything that you do online, but especially for affiliate traffic. We've seen this happen in many programs where um, the traffic was increasing, the conversion rate was at 0.5%, and just by tweaking that landing page, we were able to increase that fivefold. And split testing is essentially a method of marketing testing whereby the performance of two versions of a landing page are being tested, one against the other. The goal is to determine which page is the better page. And that is being judged by the lower bounce rate, by the better conversion rate. Let me give you an example. Courtesy of Wider Funnel, um, they have given me this example to use. They've uh, been split testing um, the landing page to which affiliates were sending traffic for Singular Software. Now, the goal of this page was to facilitate downloads. And affiliates were one of the channels through which the traffic was coming. They created three challenger pages. 
a minimalist version, a screenshot isolation, and a video player isolation. They've tested the performance of each, and they arrived at the winner, which was yielding a 17% conversion lift. How did they achieve it? Well, they introduced a value proposition headline. They refined the copywriting, making it more persuasive, more concise at the same time. They introduced clear calls to action, clarified product features, and introduced testimonials as well. Now, one of the reasons why I think we are not testing as much, especially in the framework of affiliate marketing or affiliate programs, is because very few platforms, be it uh, platforms for in-house affiliate programs or affiliate networks provide us with tools to do that. Now, to test these things, headlines, calls to action, page style and layout, positioning of things, color of buttons, images on the page, descriptive copy, pricing and promos, we need tools to see which one worked best, which one didn't work so well, to build on the successes, to cut off what didn't work, and there are plenty of free to low cost tools which you can use for that. From Google Website Optimizer to Visual Website Optimizer, Liveball, A Bingo, this whole list. Um, if you haven't written it all down, and there will be slides with much longer text later on in the presentation, don't worry, I'll have this whole presentation in full in my blog at the end of the day today. And the blog URL is on the business cards that I've handed to every one of you, amnavigator.com slash blog. So use these tools, but it is also worth mentioning that there are platforms that offer split testing environments. For example, Avangate, a, an affiliate network that is focused on software. They have this um, uh, link uh, to A-B testing in the left-hand side um, sidebar, and then on the bottom of the screen, you can see that you can actually split traffic between three, you can only see two of the scenarios here, but you can split it between three different landing pages and measure which one worked better for you, which one yielded more conversions. Then there's an in-house software, in-house um, affiliate program software has offers, which offers a very similar tool. It allows you to create both um, landing pages and banners. And then you can see there where the arrow is optimization, it says, and I've uh, picked revenue per thousand impressions. You can actually optimize it based on a specific metric, on a specific result. And you have two ways of optimizing it. This is where it gets even more beautiful. You can either manually pick the winner or the page that you the, was the winner and that you want to um, show to the affiliate referred traffic, or you can let them automatically display the better performing page um, more frequently or the better performing creative more frequently. Kind of, kind of like Google AdWords, where they display the better performing uh, paid search ad more frequently. This is the second screenshot which shows you which uh, metrics it measures from clicks to CTR to conversions and the total cost. I've used this picture before in one of my presentations at um, Affiliate Summit. Does anyone know or remember what this is? It is Cambridge, Trinity College at the University of Cambridge. I love this place. And but it's not because I love this place or because I went to a college next door and have fond memories connected with this particular college that I show this to you, but because out of this one college, in early 1930s, during Stalin times, the Soviet intelligence recruited the Cambridge Five, or the five British nationals who were recruited to spy on Britain for the Soviet Union. And of course, it's competitive intelligence that I'm gonna discuss next. A practice that we are not very frequently um, engaged in, but we should be. And competitive intelligence, as we all know, is the process by which companies inform themselves of their rivals, of every aspect of their rivals' activities and performance. What do you want to monitor? You monitor things like this, technologies they use, their product and service features, their price levels, 
Very frequently, prices may differ depending on what channel the traffic comes through. Sometimes when they come through the affiliate channel, prices are somewhat different. Not necessarily the practice that I encourage, but you measure that. You, you um, monitor that. Customer-oriented promos, discounts, rebates, distribution channels they use. Even within affiliate marketing, which I really do not believe to be a channel, but more of a context whereby um, marketers that market through different channels are remunerated on performance basis. You pay them when performance happens. So what channels are they employing even through affiliates? Delivery methods they support. Perceptions they create about their brand and the means of creating these, uh, these perceptions online. Online marketing methods the merchant themselves employs. Affiliate oriented promos and Finally, affiliate program specifics, from commissions and cookie life to performance-based incentives to contests they may be running to the presence they may be having at shows like the Affiliate Summit. As we do all of these things, this is the aspect that we so very frequently miss, the practical application. So very often, people who are engaged in competitive intelligence gather the information for the sake of gathering the information and reporting it. Yet Sina Sharp said that the real purpose of good competitive intelligence is to learn and to act and not to merely collect data or develop information. So keep in mind the practical focus. Look at everything through the lens of this, of what can I do with this information that I've found? How can I be a step ahead of the competitor? And here are five ways um, in which you can spy on your competition. You can. Number one, analyze their performance statistics for affiliate programs specifically. Register and become their affiliate through the affiliate networks or the platforms they run their affiliate programs on and monitor which of the um, creative performs better. Sort them by EPC or the average affiliate earnings per 100 clicks or by their conversion rate and monitor what exactly works best for them, both in their creatives, landing pages, specific campaigns. Number two, become their customer and their affiliate, thereby subscribing to their customer-oriented uh, promos and affiliate-oriented newsletters. Number three, create automatic monitoring campaigns. Google Alerts will cover most of the areas, and for social, there are things like social mention that you can use. Number four, friend and follow them on Facebook, on uh, Google+, on Twitter, not from your corporate accounts. Number five, employ traffic measuring tools such as Quantcast or Compete.com or SEMrush. Analyze their traffic, where it comes from, who exactly visits their website, and do it in a comprehensive way. And here's why. As you engage in competitive intelligence, you will quickly learn that some metrics are pretty misleading. And let me give you an example. I've mentioned analyzing the competitor's creatives based on the EPC, or the average um, amount of money an affiliate earns on 100 clicks with this program. Here's an example from Commission Junction. This particular merchant has, I've sorted their creatives by the EPC, and you take a look at the first two. Do you see any difference? Well, for the sake, to be just, this is a, a, um, a GIF. So the second frame of this banner is somewhat different, but not that different to yield the fourfold EPC difference. Not that different. Why does this happen? Well, simply because it's number one there. It's listed, it was uploaded as number one, so when an affiliate frequently in a rush of things, looking for a quick affiliate link. They log into uh, the network. They pick up the URL, the affiliate um, tracking code for the very first link that they see. And this is why you will often see that the very first creative actually shows the highest EPC. It doesn't mean that the, cop the, the wording on this banner is more persuasive on, than on the second one just in, as in this case. So beware of these things and analyze everything under the umbrella of comprehensiveness uh, as you engage in competitive intelligence. And now we go to our common problems and challenges that affiliate program managers face. And we'll start with coupons. 
I'm not going to address the question of the value of coupon affiliates or online coupons to your business. It's outside the realm of this particular presentation, and it's up to your business to decide whether they add value or not. What I am going to address today are the common problems associated with coupons, online coupons, and um, coupon affiliates. Problem number one. I'm sure many of us in this room are concerned about this one. Last minute coupon search. They've already added item to their shopping cart. They are, they've already started checking out and then they see this promo code box or um, coupon code box. So what do they do? They leave your website, they go to their favorite search engine, they search for a coupon, they find it frequently on an affiliate website. They click the link on that affiliate website, the cookie gets set, and the affiliate gets credited for the sale that may have originally come from your, from your paid search ad or from some display ad or from some other um, channel. We'll address this question in a second, but let me quickly run through the other three problems. Pseudo couponing. It's essentially when you don't have coupons, but you're still being featured on coupon affiliate websites. We'll address this one in a second too. Coupon affiliates joining Affiliate programs that said, that wrote it into their terms of service agreement that we do not accept coupon affiliates. You will still end up having coupon affiliates. We'll address this one in a second too. And finally, coupon scraping. When um, affiliates harvest the web for all coupons that exist for, for a particular merchant and feature it on their website, and inevitably they scrape some of the exclusive coupons that you assign to specific affiliates for their specific campaigns. Number one, last minute coupon search, which I've um, just described um, in great detail. In 2010, Macy's realized that they are losing money through this. When people have already decided they'll buy and they see that Macy's has a have a promo code box and um, when they reach that promo code box, they start searching for it. So what did they do? They added one little link, find one now. And when you click that link without leaving Macy's website, you stay within uh, the website and you see all available coupons. The end user grabs it, applies it in their shopping cart. No one left the website. No one found an affiliate website and the affiliate was not in the sequence. This is a very easy to implement solution. Pseudo couponing is another thing. I told you about the business that I started back in um, mid 90s, late 90s, and I actually sold it about six years ago. Uh, I also told you about that part. But I, that particular business did not have online coupons. And I've checked with the new owner of um, the company, it changed hands twice. Um, and I asked them, do you, so you, you are featured on all these affiliates' websites. Do you, have you started having coupons? They said, no, we've never had coupons. Yet there will be affiliates who will have, who will obviously optimize their whole website to rank well for the brand name plus coupon or brand name plus promo code on search engines. And there's no coupon, but they have the link. Click here to get RussianLegacy.com promo codes and discount codes. There are no promo codes for this merchant. Some do even this. This particular affiliate says free shipping on all orders. No code required, activate coupon. Come on, they ship from overseas most of the time and they don't do free shipping and there's no coupon to activate. What do you do with these affiliates? You will discover this behavior and you police and enforce compliance. You write it into your terms of service that this is not the activity you encourage because essentially the affiliate cookie will get set and you will end up compensating the affiliate for the sale they've referred. You can also write it into your terms of service agreement that you do not work with coupon affiliates. You can even enforce it on the application level or prevent it on the application level. When a coupon affiliate applies into your program, you decline them. That terms of service agreement or your diligence in um, reviewing affiliate applications will not safeguard you from ending up with having coupon affiliates in your program because someone may have a different website listed um, for their main website and you do not know that they have a coupon affiliate website. Instead of worrying how do you weed them out because, well, there is a solution. Just do not display that uh, promo code box to the affiliate referred traffic and then they have nothing to apply in, into that code, so you don't pay money on that. 
Number four is coupon scraping. This is my favorite one. Well, the first one and this one too. Back in uh, August of 2009, Bayat came with the solution to deal with the coupon scraping or uh, coupon theft, really, when some, some affiliate has an exclusive coupon and another affiliate gets it and uses it and gets compensated for it. What Bayat did, this is an affiliate network, um, they created this offer central feature where when you create an exclusive coupon, you can assign it to a specific affiliate. And then whatever affiliate uses it online, if it goes through an affiliate code, it credits the commission back to the original affiliate. So they can distribute the coupon as long as they want because it credits it back to the original affiliate. Well, wait until you see this. Impact radius uh, went even one step further. They... Uh, when you create this online action tracker, you can enable um, unique coupon tracking. And this is how your pixel looks like. Where I've highlighted it, it says your promo code. So you have this unique promo code that you've assigned to a specific affiliate. And then regardless of the media that is being used to promote this coupon, that affiliate gets the commission. I mean, print, radio, word of mouth, anything. As a result... The affiliates are confident in your tracking solution or your affiliate program. And uh, look at what Shopping Bargains does. They tweet things that they post on their website. This is an affiliate. And for every um, link, for every coupon, they have a link. Apart from the ones for, for um, Tommy Hilfiger. You can see that they actually tweet the, the actual code. Well, they also have a link which leads to the description of the coupon on their website. But I discussed this with uh, Mike Allen, the owner of Shopping Bargains, just a week ago. And he said, we'll love it when people retweet these things. Of course they do, because it tracks back to the original affiliate. So do look into solutions like these to prevent this. This is another very interesting uh, mosquito type question. Adware and toolbars. Well, let me say something initially before I get into the subject. Um, there's nothing wrong with toolbars as such. Things do become wrong when the toolbar interjects itself into the, the shopping process. I'll give you a couple of examples, but what you want to be aware of are downloadable applications, browser add-ons, also known as browser helper objects, that may interfere with one or more of your online marketing channels. And let me give you this example. It's a video that I shot back about a year and a half ago where we downloaded a toolbar of a particular affiliate who uses a great marketing method uh, which is cause-related you can donate to a cause of your choice, to a charity of your choice. And we've analyzed how the toolbar behaves depending on what traffic um, refers, what, what channel the traffic is being referred to uh, through. We tested it on Barnes & Noble. And As we continue to look into the question of adware affiliates and their place I don't know in if the you can hear that. Channel. Let's look at two brief examples, and uh, we'll be looking at them as a user that has previously installed a wikiair.com reminder plugin. So we'll be seeing on how it. Let's go to our browser. Reacts here we have our to browser, two things this here: window, the organic traffic and the affiliate links. We have our temper data um, plugin, which allows us to track cookies that are being set on our machine. The click serve. URL here is a Google affiliate network um, URL through which affiliate links go. So let us now type in Barnes & Noble. Thankfully, Google suggestions allow us to go directly to their website here. We are clicking it's Google on this back link, then. We didn't have Google and instantly. we have the reminder pop-up. Okay, up see what happened? Asking us if we would like we typed it a in. percentage of our purchase. We knew that we wanted Barnes & Noble. of our purchases. We landed Barnes through that organic. To, to our wecare.com cause. A link. We decide that we do not want to do it. We click no, and we don't see any cookie being set on our machine. Now let's 
close this window, I have found out that the plugin does not pop up until you close and reopen your browser window. So let's wait on our Firefox a little bit here and reopen it again. So now what we're going to do, we're going to go to an affiliate website and see what happens when one affiliate we'll refers us to a Firefox and then also go to our temper data. This is a handy Type plugin in temper data which our lets filter. you see and um, go directly to an affiliate website. What cookies are being set as you click the link? Let's paste this in here. Okay, so shopping bargains again. I go to a specific page of Barnes & Noble on this particular affiliate's website to see what happens when I click on affiliate one affiliate's link. Okay, shopping bargains is an affiliate website. Let's click the Barnes & Noble link and we will see two things happening. First, there is a cookie being set on our computer. You can see it here the cookie f that shows the merchant Barnes & Noble that it was shopping bargains that referred us to them. Now if in this case we see the pop-up again, which we do see regardless of us previously stating that we do not want to have a percentage of our purchases go to the We Care cause, and if in this case we click the Yes button, we will see down here that the cookie gets overridden by another cookie, and in this case, it is the WeCare.com cookie. So the now you can make your conclusions for yourself whether this is uh, beneficial this particular situation. But if you go to whether this is beneficial to you or not, but if you go to my YouTube channel, I'll give you a link in a second. You will actually see what happens when you click a paid search link, or the paid search link of a merchant or find some organically well-optimized page where the affiliate really does not belong to the channel. So this is where the problem really begins, when this toolbar interjects itself into this shopping channel. And here's another, as we continue, and here's another situation, it's a pop-up which goes on top, kind of like in Macy's case, only this is an affiliate website, igive.com, which pops up on top of the merchant's website, allposters.com, and also offers you coupons. So as the end user, you may be thinking, well, I still win, you know, but as a merchant, sometimes it's not that beautiful because you end up paying for something that you should have not been paying, like in case with your paid search campaigns, or it gets even worse when a good affiliate does not want to join your affiliate program because you work with these adware and um, uh, toolbar type of affiliates. Now, I encourage you to educate yourself, well, first of all, to have a TOS clause if you decide that this does not value in your case. Secondly, you will want to monitor and enforce compliance. And thirdly, this was what I was getting at, learn to play without the ball. Are you constantly monitoring what's going on in this particular niche? Um, there are actually researchers and people who spend time catching this behavior and seeing and analyzing how it acts and how it ended up on the end user computer. Um, just recently, funnily enough, I um, discovered that there's a um, pop-up on my computer and my wife's computer which came bundled up with some um, software. I don't remember which one. It was one of the either Weather Channel or something. It comes bundled up with other software and then ends up on the end user machine. And you end up paying when the end user cannot even get rid of this thing. And good affiliates do not join your affiliate program. So what this TOS clause, you will be able to see this on my website at the end of the day today. I'll have it, um, the whole presentation. But for resources, I recommend you to check out Ben Edelman's website, benedelman.org. 
He does a lot of research in this um, subject. Then also look at affiliatefairplay.com of uh, Kelly Stevens, who can help you police these things and uh, monitor these things. And then also look at my YouTube channel for some additional examples of this. Trademark violations is another big topic that we should address today. And let me give you an example. When we go to Google and we search for a brand, one of the first things that we see is reviews in the Google Instant Suggestions. And if in this particular case where um, we look for big commerce, um, we click uh, big commerce reviews, we see three keyword rich domains rank in the first 10. The first one, reviewbigcommerce.com, belongs to the merchant and it's marked with the green arrow. The other two belong to affiliates. Affiliates are smart. They've realized this works and they've started registering domains with these two keywords, big commerce and reviews. In fact, the last one is, the, is an exact match domain. It's uh, bigcommercereviews.com. Now, this particular merchant says that in paid search, they are prohibiting trademarks, but they don't say anything about domains. And maybe it's okay for them. It's their call. But what I'm getting at is do not call it a violation unless you've explicitly prohibited it in your terms of service clause. If you've prohibited it in your paid search policies, it doesn't necessarily imply that affiliates will not be doing that in URLs. And again, in some cases, you cannot even prohibit it when your uh, brand name is close to a generic name. They can um, still register domain names with that. Now, when you prohibit things, do not prohibit them like this. This is a picture of a sign that I shot uh, next to an elevator in Riviera Maya three weeks ago. Three Indians, a big one and two little ones. The first small one holds the hand of the big one, and the second little one is crossed out. Now I thought and told my wife, well, probably they are trying to say that kids should be holding hands with um, adults to enter the elevator. And then a couple of days later, she said, no, I think they are trying to say that kids should not ride the elevator on their own. And the consensus was never reached, So, what I'm, but what I'm trying to get at, do not give them signs. Give the exact wording. It will help everyone. And as you safeguard trademarks, I recommend safeguarding trademarks and domain names as your paid search keywords. In other words, if it's brandname.com that your website is, prohibit that as a paid search term that you do not want affiliates to be bidding it, um, on. Again, if it's... Um, Calendars, for example, in case with calendars.com, I cannot see how calendars can prohibit bidding on the word calendars. Prohibit, prohibit also trademarks and domain names, and I advocate this. It's up to you to decide again whether this adds value in your case or not. And most importantly, include the misspellings and variations wording. And here's why. This particular merchant, great merchant, I love what they are doing and, and how they are doing things, they prohibit uh, uh, trademark bidding. Um, and uh, they prohibit bidding on their domain name, which is beddingstyle.com. But look at what affiliates are doing. Betting space style space com is the keyword that they are bidding on, or beddingspacestyle.com, or Further down, www.bettingstylespace.com, because people search that way, and affiliates will be bidding on this. So if you prohibit this as well, include the trademark uh, misspellings and variations wording. How do you police these things? Some people try to catch it by hand. It never works. I trademark bidding is a very good tool to look at with some basic coding, you can make it work for your particular brand to police your particular keywords. There are also some paid tools, which I highly recommend looking into. They are extremely robust, like a Brand Verity's Poachmark, for example. In fact, the previous screenshot that I showed you was from this particular tool. They are excellent. They give you the timestamp, the exact ad. They segment whether it was an ad jack or your paid search ad being used by an affiliate, the exact wording that already works for you. So affiliate borrowed that and linked that through an affiliate link. They also monitor it 
let you choose different locations where to monitor, monitor it around the clock. Another one very similar tool, and I believe they are at the conference, um, is the search monitor, the searchmonitor.com, also worth having a look at. And then there's AdGuru Trademark Insight. Um, these la latter three are paid, and you can evaluate them and see which one works best for you. If you prohibit trademark usage in domain names, CitizenHawk is a great tool to employ to monitor that. And on we go to our very last subject, and that is FTC compliance. In 2011, FTC charged a merchant $2,500. For what? I've highlighted um, uh, the key parts in their official press release. For deceptively advertising through online affiliate marketers, what did they do? They advertised using an online affiliate program, all FTC's wording, recruiting review ad affiliates who posted endorsements as articles and posts and received a substantial commission in return. So they summarized, we are charging them for disseminating deceptive advertisements. What exactly are they talking about? In December, on December 1st, uh, 2009 came out the Federal Trade Commission's rules on endorsements and uh, testimonials. In essence, they say that any merchant affiliate relationship is deemed by the FTC as a sponsor endorser relationship. The merchant is the sponsor, they are paying money, and the affiliate is the endorser. They are um, putting up testimonials or ads that are being sponsored. And it is the affiliate that is supposed to clearly disclose the relationship by providing a, um, an easily accessible um, disclosure policy. Um, and then the, not the disclosure policy, but the, the disclosure itself that uh, they are associated with the merchant. And the advertiser or the affiliate is responsible for educating, equipping, and policing compliance. Now, how do you comply with this? Not to get into the situation like our previous example. First of all, again, we go back to the terms of service agreement. I have the full sample text on my website in my blog later today. I'll provide a link to this. You can take it, reword it, use it for yourself. And the subclause of affiliate uh, obligations will say that you are serious about the topic. I'll show you an example and that you encourage them to adhere um, to the regulations. Secondly, provide affiliates with disclosure templates. How exactly do you expect them to comply? Show them. Then routinely and yes, manually analyze the sites of your top performers, whether they comply, whether they have the disclosure up. And finally, look at solutions like search reviews, which allows you to streamline um, the uh, policing or invest into a tool of your own. It will be wor well worth it. The FTC is very serious. Um, they are saying that they will charge an affiliate up to $10,000 each, and we've seen that they um, uh, do fine merchants. The subclause example is here. You'll have it uh, in the presentation later on, both in my blog and Affiliate Summit uh, on, on SlideShare will post it as well. Um, emphasize that you strongly advise them to stay compliant with the rules, um, and the rules say where there exists a connection between the endorser and the seller of the advertised product, it is imperative that such a connection is fully disclosed. And then provide a link to the FTC's rules. And then say that you strongly, that you share the idea, strongly encourage them to uh, adhere to the FTC's rules, and also reserve the right to terminate the relationship with any non-compliant affiliates. In our case, in the example, um, that I've used for the fine, the 250,000 fine, the majority of affiliates were actually overseas, but the merchant was in the United States. It's that serious. For resources, I've shortened um, the longer URL to the PDF with the actual um, guidelines to one.usa.gov. Um, slash FTC dash affiliates. Then there are videos also that you can see where the FTC explains what exactly they mean. And then there's a comprehensive section of FAQ, frequently asked questions on their website where they explain what they mean and um, how 
and who is expected to uh, comply. Finally, if you don't remember any of this, again, my blog, amnavigator.com slash blog, look for FTC disclosure guidelines. I have over a dozen of articles, including the actual disclosure templates that you can let affiliates use. And again, I'll have this posted later on today. In conclusion, I told you that I went to Mexico earlier this year um, where I shot the picture of the uh, Indians, the two little ones and the big ones, the uh, two big ones. I also um, was lucky enough to go to Israel, another place of an ancient civilization last year. And I also went to China. Very interesting experience. Um, and at the end of my trip, the guide asked me whether I would like to attend a tea ceremony at a Chinese tea house owned by the governor of Beijing where they serve you this great tea. They actually um, popularized the idea of tea drinking and show you how to brew tea. In some cases, um, when you drink it, you need to rinse your mouth with it. In other cases, you just sip. All this beautiful, I said, of course, let's go. And this presentation um, took 20 minutes. Great tea. Excellent experience. At the end of the presentation, the girl asks, do you have any questions, sir? Of course I do. Where do you get all this great tea? Because I've never tried anything like this, and I'm Russian. We drink this stuff every day. My whole family does. So sure enough, she says, we have a store right here. They have a store right there at the free uh, tea house where she shows you into the store, helps you pick the tea. And I ended up spending 250 bucks on tea that day. Now, we drink tea, but we don't spend more than 30 bucks a month on tea. The Chinese have learned something there. You gotta give something before you can expect the consumer to commit to something. And we as affiliate program managers should also learn from that, that performance-based doesn't mean effortless. We should provide affiliates with the tools to succeed. We should also invest our time into the recruitment, activation, policing, communication, and optimization of our creatives, landing pages, of our campaigns to help them succeed with our affiliate program. So I have five action points as they crawl up. I want to thank you for being a great audience, very attentive. Um, and I, many of you know that I'm a fishing fan because um, I post this stuff, you know, me with different fish that I actually catch um, on Twitter. And I came with some bait, um, just as in New York, it is my um, latest book, Affiliate Program Management, An Hour a Day. Now, I will autograph the book and uh, give the three copies to the three people who, in the Q&A time, will also mention something that I haven't mentioned, that they've bumped into, and also provide a solution so that we could all learn from. So thank you for your attention, and let's open it to questions and answers. And you can use the mic, or there is also, um, like it was mentioned earlier this morning, two other way, ways you can either text to this number, tweet to F some space 3870, or submit it via form. Or there's a mic right there in the middle of the room to, for everyone who would like to embarrass themselves. I will also be available between 1 and 2 at booth 107. That's my office hour. And I will be happy to, that's the speaker's booth, and I will be answering people's questions there. So if you don't ask your question now, you can come up to me there. Any questions? Yes, sir. Could you use the mic, please? Um, have you found that the affiliate networks, the CJs and such, do a, a fairly good job of policing the policies, or have you found that that requires a lot more additional on top of policing? Great question. Uh, do affiliate networks do a good enough job of policing compliance with your policies, or do you need to do your own work? The latter. They don't police for you. In the vast majority of cases, it's really not their job either. They are providing you with the solution um, to track, to pay, 
um, to upload your creatives, to create your campaigns, but policing is nowhere in most of their of these networks' responsibilities, and um, they know why they are doing that. Um, you do want to, that's exactly why I mentioned this here. Very often, I have this blog post on my blog where um, a guy asked, well, I, you're saying that this particular platform is so great, but we've been with them a year, and we haven't grown at all. And again, it's the role of affiliate network being mistaken for the role of an affiliate manager. They are not committing to recruit for you or to activate or to police or to do any of the other affiliate management tasks. So yeah, definitely that's the, the, the affiliate program managers. In the fine that the uh, FTC leveled there, how egregious or abusive was the advertising? Can you give a, a more detailed example of what the site did to earn a $250,000 fine? Yes, they had uh, blogs, um, affiliate running blogs and review websites where they were posting reviews of the advertiser's product, positioning themselves as independent reviewers and not disclosing that there is a relationship between the merchant and that they are being compensated should a sale happen. And that was the whole deal. Wow. Thank you. Sure. Uh, have you seen affiliates uh, running adverts campaigns only in certain geographical areas to bypass monitoring? And do you know any tools that will help kind of like enforcing this if this is happening. Yeah, great Oxford sweatshirt, by the way. I lived in Oxford for three years. Um, the tools is the only way to uh, catch the geo-targeting and the day parting, the, the tools that automatically monitor these things for you. Uh, they actually monitor it around the clock as opposed to you being able to manually check when you are up. So that's the whole beauty of automating the whole process wherever you can. And specifically with trademark bidding, there's no way to catch geotargeting or day parting. Go ahead. One of the things that you mentioned was when uh, an affiliate signs up and the URL isn't active. You need the to URL reach out to what? The URL isn't active. Okay. You need to reach out to the affiliate because a lot of times the people building websites, they want to get their information in place. At least I find that when I reach out to them, they'll give me their explanation and, and go ahead and, you know, they're in process. The URL will be active in another few months or whatever the time frame is. So I'm just pointing out because you just had the URL, is, if it's not active, it's usually a red flag. Just want to mention that you need to reach out to them as well. I. Uh did say that if the website is uh, inaccessible, right. You, you, right, it's a red flag, but none of those, and I'm a huge uh, proponent of the idea that none of these should mean automatic decline. Like on many affiliate networks, you can actually write in criteria, um, and when an affiliate meets them, they get automatically declined. It's, I, and I, you haven't seen uh, country-specific uh, red flags, which I also don't believe to be um, an issue, you can have great affiliates from overseas, but uh, you're right, contact them, and right, and if they are, they have a, an idea for you that you think is great, you can work with them, and it can be all right. Yes, ma'am? Uh, first, are you familiar with a evaluation tool called SpyFu? I am familiar with them, but I'm, I've never tried them myself. Okay, I just wanted to see if you found it was actually a useful tool to see what search affiliates might be up to in terms of how uh, how valid their paid search efforts are, because it's something that uh, if you put in the website URL, can show you what that advertiser, that merchant or affiliate perhaps it has uh, bid on over the last six months in terms of their top keywords. So do you right. find tools like that useful in the evaluation process or monitoring? 
Definitely, uh, yeah, but I, for policing, is your main question for policing reasons? Uh, policing and also evaluating whether or not to approve a new affiliate who's uh, primarily search based on PPC. Definitely, yes. And I, Jared, did you have something to add to this? No? Okay. Oh, okay. Two questions on the screen. We do have the screen now. If an affiliate offers a deal that is not true or a deal has expired, is that a violation of the Federal Trade Commission rules? Um, that's a good question. And I uh, do not know that um, there is a policy on this. If anyone in the room does, I this was not something that I've No, no one knows. Okay. How do you reach and recruit an affiliate who doesn't respond to your recruitment emails, nor a template email? There are several ways, and one of the more effective ones is snail mail. You can discover their mailing address uh, by pulling the who is data and mailing them a postcard. It works beautifully, and I've um, seen it work beautifully myself and some very few affiliate program managers are using this but it's really good um, but I have this follow-up idea that you need to follow up with them at least three times and again you can um, um, search my blog I have articles on this um, yes yeah, snail mail try snail mail um, what affiliate software do you recommend for running in-house affiliate program I try to stay away from recommendations like this. The ones that I've mentioned today are pretty robust. They're on my blog, I also have the list among the top ones I'd mentioned. Has offers, post affiliates, um, uh, pro, um, and um, look at also direct track and other solutions. And there's a huge list again on my website, on my blog, amnavigator.com slash blog. Yes, sir. When it comes to affiliate recruiting and setting policies, um, is that pretty influential in affiliates choosing to join a merchant? And, and if so, is there advice or recommendations as far as if, if you don't necessarily have a hard choice on a policy, but maybe swinging one way or the other based upon better influencing affiliates to join the network? Can you give some insight from that perspective? Well, let me let me. Does that make Just, sense? Yeah, <laughs> let me let me see if I understand the question. Um, does does the way you word your terms of service agreement influence what type of affiliates apply into your program? And then, if you don't have a, any rigid terms on a particular question, should you avoid it or should you? Or, or do you have advice or, or in, insight as to what affiliates want or don't want and right, right. lean one way or well, the other? Well, yeah, the template is on my website and I'll post it on my blog today and that pretty much reflects what I believe um, works best for good affiliates to be joining your program and see that you're serious about um, your program. Very many programs won't have terms of service agreements. Again, to the affiliate networks question, um, some presuppose that um, it's the affiliate networks terms of service agreement that binds the affiliate when they get into a relationship with this particular merchant. It is, it is not so. It safeguards the network, but not the merchant. So you want to have your own agreement. And um, But does it prohibit violations? Unfortunately, not. It only provides you grounds for policing and for enforcing compliance because there's something to be to comply with. In fact, the vast majority of affiliates don't even read the terms of service agreement. Um, again, the stats are in my blog, but it's more than a half. Scroll down to the bottom, tick the box, I agree, because they cannot proceed further. So, you know, and for t to address that part, um, earlier at Affiliate Summit East in New York, I recommended providing a summary of the key points that you want them to see. Um, right before that long text, you know, just really bullet point, easy to digest, so that they really see that you're serious about this and, and, and you know what you're doing. 
can you give us some insights as to what affiliates want to see in their e-newsletter? Do they want to see deals, news? What is it that they want to see and what don't they want to see? That's a great question, newsletters. Um, now, first of all, it depends on how frequently you send that one out. And uh, I recommend sending it out not more frequently than um, every other week. Um, monthly works too. And that comes from affiliate preferences and response to AFSTAT, the Affiliate Summit's um, uh, report on the state of the industry and what affiliates prefer. Um, do include the things that will help them succeed. Say you have this great new widget that you want them to promote um, or work with, or you have the top 10 list of uh, the best sellers for this particular season, or you have a promo. Of course, you do want to include you know, two types of promos. You'll have affiliates that are stagnant, um, and you'll want to activate them. That's an activation promo. You know, send us so many clicks or you know, so many um, you know, place our banner on your website, and uh, we will do something for you. We'll increase your cookie life or whatever. Um, or, uh, and then there are um, performance um, uh, promos. You know, you want them. Some will be sending you clicks, but no sales. So you want to facilitate that too. Again. Uh, Check out my blog. I have a lot more in it on the subject. And the book, too. Yes, sir. You mentioned about um, competitive intelligence that you would sign up um, your blog to your competitor and see how you're performing. Does that make sense? I've mentioned competitive intelligence and monitoring the blog. Your blog. So your site. You want. You have a blog that you want to sign up to your competitor, so you can see stats. This kind of things. No. I've. When I talked about signing up for something, I meant their affiliate programs. Say they are on the affiliate network. Um, that you are not aboard yet as an affiliate. You open an affiliate account. You join their program. And through that, you subscribe to their affiliate-oriented newsletters. If they run a blog, yeah, do subscribe to the RSS. You have to have a blog in order to, to right, join the program. Right, right. But it, if you spy on them as a customer, mm -hmm. join their newsletter or buy something from them to get on their list to really see what, how they are targeting customers. For affiliates, join their affiliate program and thereby subscribing to the newsletters that they send to affiliates to monitor what they are doing um, with affiliates. Sure. Back to the newsletter thing, is there anything that they don't want to see? Is there something we should not be sending them? Say it again. Back to the affiliate newsletter. Um, is there something that they don't want to see? Is something we should not be sending them? Anything we should not be including? The useless stuff. They receive thousands of these, uh, you know, things that really won't help them much at all, repeating stuff. Yeah, the time is actually up, so, you know, if I'm happy to meet with anyone who wants to meet after the session, or again, booth 107, uh, between 1 and 2. Thank you.